All right, all right. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Grace Chapel Baptist. We're so glad to have you with us. If you are our, our guest, we hope you feel uh, like our honored guest. We want you to, to, to feel that and hope that our folks have, have gotten to know you a little bit in the time we've had together. I'm going to run over a few announcements real quick, just tell you kind of what's going on in the life of the body. We will uh, celebrate as, as a church tonight the, the Lord's Supper. That'll be at 6 p.m. I'd encourage you to be back here uh, for that tonight. Tomorrow night, as always, we'll have our, our regularly scheduled men's Bible study, 6.30. And then uh, please do grab a newsletter. If you don't have one, they're right there on that table as you walk out on the left. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. You can get some more detailed information uh, about stuff going on in the life of the church uh, from that. So, so please do that. Um, only other thing, uh, we, were, we are going to kind of start uh, another membership uh, conversation. So we'll have uh, hopefully some new, new members at the end of the month. So if you are in that kind of group category where you've been visiting for a while and you said, huh, I think the Lord's calling me to, to join here at, at this church, be a member here and covenant together with these people. Uh, just ask me about that. Uh, if you don't ask me about that, I might ask you about that uh, and just see where we're at with that. So uh, we will start some of those conversations again. And then uh, last thing, we, uh, we don't have offering time during the service. There are boxes at the front on both sides and in the back for, for you uh, to give to the Lord. Uh, let me pray for us and we'll get started with the praise team. Uh, Lord, we do thank you so much uh, for the privilege to get to be here uh, this morning, to gather together in worship, uh, to be called and commanded to do that. Uh, Lord, I pray that this morning, Lord, that everything that's said and done would be to your honor and your glory, uh, to the edification uh, of your body, that your people uh, might be presented uh, fully equipped uh, for the work of ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Please stand. <clears throat>
Uh, thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to spend a, just a moment in, in prayer. Uh, again, events going on, life's going on in the life of the body. I'm going to frame that out for us a little bit. Psalm uh, 37. Psalm 37, beginning in verse 1. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Uh, be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, as your word uh, says, even right now, uh, we do not want to fret uh, over evildoers, Lord. We live in a world uh, filled with sin and darkness, and your word commands us uh, not to fret over it. Lord, we know that you are sovereign. We know that you are in control. Lord, we know that you are good and right and worthy and that you uh, can uh, be trusted. So, Lord, make us a people who, who trust in you, who do delight ourselves in you. Lord, as we strive to delight in you, we thank you, Lord, that we are soon uh, approaching the Easter season. It's time when we can uh, set aside to celebrate in a particular way the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would make us as a body a, a faithful people, uh, a people who uh, are willing, uh, people who are obedient to reach out to others, Lord, to proclaim your good news to a lost and dying world, to folks who need uh, to hear the goodness of your grace. Lord, make us uh, faithful to do that. And Lord, I pray uh, that we would be a faithful people in that. Lord, we not only pray uh, for the work of the gospel here in, uh, in, the, in our midst, in the community. Lord, we pray for that uh, abroad. We pray for uh, Miss Judith at Children of Purpose Orphanage in Kenya. Lord, I thank you for even conversations I was able to have with her uh, today. Lord, we pray uh, that you would, would continue to strengthen her as she stewards the work that's been entrusted to her there to run a, an orphanage and to care for the widows in that part of Kenya. Lord, I pray. Uh, that you would meet uh, the basic needs of those children, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to give them uh, what they need. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would provide the funds uh, necessary to, to pay teachers, Lord, as they have a, a meager salary, Lord. We do ask uh, that you would provide that. We thank you, Lord, that you've seen fit uh, to, to bring 120 children uh, there for, for that orphanage to care for. And so, Lord, uh, we pray that she would just continue to steward uh, that well, that the gospel would be preached and proclaimed uh, to those children. They might be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, even as they uh, are without parents. Uh, Lord, we pray for the work of, uh, of your gospel preaching, even here in, in, in our community and in the counties around us. Lord, this morning we just want to lift up uh, Pastor Scott Cobb as he's at Lakeside Baptist Church in Union, South Carolina. I thank you for my connection with him. Lord, I thank you for how our lives have overlapped and crossed. Lord, I pray that you would continue to make that body uh, a more faithful body, conform to the image of the Lord Jesus, Lord, that he uh, would preach your word, uh, that he would stick to your word, Lord, and that, the, it, that your word would stick to him. Lord, I pray that that congregation would just increasingly grow uh, in number and in health, and Lord, I pray that your hand of blessing would be upon it. Bless our relationship, bless our partnership in the days ahead. And Lord, this morning, uh, we are now just a few moments away from the time when we, your people, will get to hear uh, your word and spend some time in it. Lord, I pray for the preaching of your word uh, right here, right now, uh, today. Lord, I pray uh, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear what you've stored up for us in it. Lord, I pray uh, that I would preach by the power of your spirit. Lord, I pray that uh, anything that would uh, bind us or distract us or confuse us or cause chaos, Lord, that you would do away with it, Lord, that we might focus on your word and who you are, Lord, that we might draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's please stand.
All right, well, if you would, uh, take your Bibles out make your way over to the book of Colossians chapter 4. The book of Colossians chapter 4. Uh, we are nearing the end of our exploration of Colossians, drawing close to its conclusion. And I think you're going to be able to tell that by our content even this morning. Uh, you know, we as, as a human people, just to be a human people, we are a communicative people. We like to communicate, right? We do things like talk. We do things like listen. We do things like make music. We do things like listen to music. We do things like write. We do things like read. We are a people who communicate. That shouldn't surprise us, right? We're created in the image of God. We're created in the image of a God who's a communicative God. The Lord communicates. The Bible talks about the Lord being light. That's a metaphor often used for him. And just as the nature of light is to reveal itself, so part of the Lord's nature is to reveal himself to us. He chiefly does that in his word. He's also done that in creation. The Lord reveals himself and reveals himself to us. So it makes sense if we're created, we're modeled after this God, we're created in the image of God that we would be a communicative people and we would care about communication. Things like words and the communication of ideas would matter to us. And so it comes as no surprise to us, it should come as no surprise to us, that some of the, the weightiest moments in history are tagged with things like speeches. We as a communicative people, we want to be communicated with, and so when some weighty moment happens or we perceive some weighty moment is about to happen, a lot of times what we do is we look towards somebody whom we perceive to be a, a leader, somebody we respect, and we hand them a microphone and we say, Guys, uh, Winston Churchill, uh, the year is 1940. Uh, Churchill is the prime minister of Britain. World War II is going on. The United States has not yet gotten involved. Britain and France are trying to fight off uh, the Germans together. It's not going super well. They are vastly uh, outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, particularly in uh, the air. The Germans are having a field day on them with their air force. Consequently, you have uh, hundreds of thousands of, of allied troops who are held up in, in the port of Dunkirk, and they're pinned in there, and it becomes very obvious that if they stay there very long, things will not end well for them. So the Brits undertake what they call Operation Dynamo. We're going to try to go in, rescue, get some of these folks out of this port. They had the, the humble hope of maybe we can get about 45,000 out. They end up getting over 300,000 out by the, by the middle of, of June. And so then in early June, just after Operation Dynamo is kind of working and, and things are going pretty well, it's kind of a new day in Britain. There's new hope. Things are going to turn around. It's a pivotal moment in the war and everybody can feel it. And so they hand Churchill a microphone and say, guide us. And he does. He spends over uh, 20 minutes kind of laying out the logistics of what's happened. Hey, here's X's and O's. Here's the problem. Here's what we've kind of had to do to solve it. And then he ends with here's what we're going to do now. Here's what, after 20 minutes, he gets a little short paragraph. Here's what we're going to do now. Let me read it to you. He says, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forward to rescue and liberate the old. So in short, he said... Here's what we're going to do now. We're going to fight like a bunch of mad, crazed dogs wherever the Germans are bold enough to show up and fight us, and we're going to hold on until the United States gets involved. That's his speech. Here's what's gone wrong. Here's what we've had to do. Here's the X's and O's. Here's all the logistics, and now here's what we're going to do. It's time to roll, and here's how we're going to roll. We're going to fight. We're going to wait. The U.S. is going to show up, and we're going to get after it. That's how he ends this speech. Very important speech. One of the most influential speeches of the 20th century. Gives hope to hurting people. Well, that's not just what's going on in World War II. That's not just what's going on in Churchill's speech. That's what's going on in the book of Colossians. Things have not gone well in some regards. The church in Colossae has fallen on hard times. Uh, false teachers have, have come in. There's some brand of false teaching going on. It's got some Judaism in it. It's got some paganism in it. It's got some different things. We've seen that over the course of the last few weeks. 
Paul has responded and said, hey, uh, remember, the gospel is central. Christ is central. Here's the implications of that for you. Here's what that looks like for you. Here's what it looks like to walk in the new self. And then today he turns and says, and now it's time to roll. Now we're going to get after it. Here's what we're going to do. Let me read the text. He will be in chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, and then we'll get going here. He writes, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Would you pray with me? Lord, as you and your word this morning tell us things that we are supposed to do as a Christian community, my simple prayer is that you would make us faithful to hear them and faithful to do them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the first thing that I would have you notice this morning, kind of as we read this text, and Paul moves from, hey, here's what's gone wrong, here's what we're going to do about it, here's what, needs to, here's what needs to happen, and he shifts into the, hey, here's what we're going to do right now. Well, the first thing I want you to catch is Paul's ultimate confidence in the Lord's power to keep these people. So the false teachers are here, they're in the midst of them, and Paul has, has written this letter to them to try to, to encourage them and to try to bolster them, to hold what they got, not shift from the gospel in the midst of all that's going on around them. And Paul, at the end of this letter, writes, and he's really, really confident that that's going to happen. He's really, really confident that the Lord is going to deal graciously with them. These people, the Lord's begun a good work in them, he's going to bring it to completion at the day of Christ, Christ Jesus. And now that we've kind of got started, now that we've seen what's gone wrong, we've seen how we're going to fix it, we've seen what we need to do now, we're commanded, let's get rolling. And so you'll see that in three particular ways. This morning, here's how this gospel people will advance. Number one, here's how this gospel people will advance through prayer. They're going to advance through prayer, and in particular, two very specific items of prayer. Look at verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So the first type of prayer that this gospel people are going to advance through is this right here, right now, in the moment. Here's what's going on in Colossae prayer. Continue steadfastly in prayer. This whole thing has really come full circle. If you'll remember from several Months ago, over in chapter 1, Paul has kind of written about, hey, I look, I know that you guys are in the, in the gospel. And so he starts to pray for them. And in chapter 1, verse 9, he says, so from the day we heard of your faith in the gospel, we've not ceased to pray for you. And so this morning, as Paul has said several weeks ago, hey, we have not ceased to pray for you. Now he's saying, you don't cease to pray for you either. Be watchful. Keep your head up. Keep your head on a swivel. Look around. See what's going on right here, right now in Colossae. And you pray for you, pray for the right here, right now things going on in life. You know, I think we as a people are, are pretty aware that prayer is, is towards the center somewhere of the Christian life. If you've been around the Christian community for any length of time at all, I trust that you know prayer is fairly important to us. We've been here for 30 minutes and we've prayed four or five times already, right? So prayer, prayer is important. Prayer is somewhere at the center of the Christian community. But I'm, I'm concerned sometimes when I hear folks talk about prayer. Do, is prayer one of those things that we think about and sometimes miss kind of the goal and, and aim of our prayer? Do we ever miss the goal and aim of what prayer is? Jesus is going to say things like in John chapter 14, verse 14, if you ask anything in, in my name, I will do it. So prayer is supposed to be in, in Jesus' name, so things that we pray uh, in, in, in the name of the Lord. We've already read Psalm chapter 37, verse, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of, of your heart. And so it's my fear that sometimes we think about prayer, we come to prayer and we think, oh, we're going to try to, to bend the Lord's will to our agenda. We've got this agenda, we've got these things we want to do, these things we want to accomplish, these things that are really exciting to us. And prayer is us trying to move the Lord to say, hey, Lord, get on our sheet of paper with us. Would you sponsor our agenda? Would you help us do all the things we want to do for us? And that's not at all what's going on here. The exact inverse is what's going on. We're trying to bend our will to the Lord's. 
That's what Jesus is talking about. Pray in my name. That's what Psalm 37 verse 4 is talking about. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart are tethered to the fact you've delighted yourself in the Lord. If your chief desire, if your chief delight is the Lord in his glory, oh, brother, oh, sister, he's going to give you that desire. He's going to give you more of him. He's going to help you see what his will is in various different situations in your life. So if your prayer is, Lord, would you uh, allow me to live my life for your glory in different situations, whatever they are, come what may, the Lord's going to give you that. The Lord's going to show you that. The Lord's going to show you how to be a faithful, obedient person. And that come what may is very important. Come what may, whatever it is. We're striving to conform our will to his will so that he might be glorified in all things. And so we're supposed to be watchful. What's going on around us? What do we do? How would the Lord have us act in that situation? So we already know we're supposed to be a faithful, pe- a prayerful people and, and a watchful people. And then we're told that we're supposed to do all this in Thanksgiving. We're supposed to be a thankful people. A thankful people. Thankfulness, I think, is all, also grounded back here in chapter 1. Why is Paul giving thanks for them in chapter 1 when he's praying for them? Well, here's his reason. Chapter 1, verse 13. He... God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Oh, brothers and sisters, we're supposed to be a thankful people. Why wouldn't we be a thankful people? The Lord's delivered us out of the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, who's redeemed us, who has forgiven our sins. And so if you're in Christ should be a thankful person. If you're in Christ and you're not a thankful person, then I just have to ask the question, what's the disconnect? If you're a Christian, if you're pro- pro- proclaiming to be a Christian, my life is wrapped up in Christ. Christ is all. He has redeemed me. He has purchased me. He's to forgive me of my sins, but I'm not very thankful. Well, if that's you, then you are just living your life unconscious of who you actually are. You're not aware of who you positionally are. Because if this is who you are, if your life is wrapped up in Christ, then what you're saying is that you are a person who stood under the rightful wrath of God. You're a person who who has a sinful nature. You've inherited it from your your ancestors all the way back. Sin comes very, very natural to you. As soon as you were able to act upon it, you acted upon that sinful nature. Now you're, you're a willful sinner against the Lord God. And he, he's not giving you what you deserve. He's looked on you in the middle of your sin, and he has sent his son to take his wrath on your behalf. He sent his son to live a righteous life on your behalf to cover the fact that you aren't a righteous person. So if everything about you is actually wrapped up in who Christ is and what he's done for you, and he is the one who's delivered you from the wrath of God. How could you not be a thankful person? You ought to be a thankful person. You ought to be the most thankful person in every room you've ever walked in ever. We're to be a thankful people, and we're to be a thankful people on account of this good news, the good news of Christ that we have heard and that we have trusted for our salvation. God being rich in love because of the mercy which he, he had for us, even when me and you were dead in our trespasses and sins, he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. That good news is the grounds of our thankfulness. And that good news is also the second thing we're told to specifically pray for. We're specifically told not just to pray for right here, right now, what's going on in Colossae, what's going on in York, South Carolina type stuff. We're also told to pray for the spread of this gospel. Look at verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. So we're praying now. We've now been commanded to pray for the spread of this gospel, particularly for the ministers who are involved in the spread of this gospel, particularly Paul and company here. I would just have you notice that word, us. It's not, it's not just I. It's not just me. You don't just pray for me. Pray for us. I've said it before, I've said it again, I'm going to keep saying it when I'm afraid that you might have understood it. I'm going to keep saying it some more so that you don't forget it. Uh, Pray for us. Christianity is a team sport, as it were. We are in this thing together. There's no individualism going on here in Christ. 
It's all about Christ, and we are here as a people who are bound together and who love him, and our lives are wrapped up in him and who he is. We are in this thing together. And so even as Paul, who you might think, well, he's a real trailblazing guy, he tells us over in Romans, his goal was to preach the gospel where it hasn't been heard. Surely he's a lone wolf type guy. No, <laughs> us. He's talking about us. We already know from the opening of this letter, Timothy's with him. He's not by himself. At least Timothy's with him. Maybe other folks are with him at this point in time. Hard to say, but he's talking about us. There's some group, us. And so even as he has people who've locked arms with him, he's now calling, commanding the Colossians to lock arm with them, to lock arms with us, lock arms with us through prayer. Pray also for us. Uh, many of you, most of you, I'm sure, well, some of us have known through conversation, uh, many of you heard of Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon uh, is often called the Prince of Preachers. He was an outstanding, uh, particularly outstanding gospel preacher in the 19th century in uh, London at a time where there were more than a few outstanding gospel preachers. But he was deemed uh, the cream of the crop. Spurgeon preached in, in London at the Met Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle. Metropolitan Tabernacle was a big place. The Metropolitan Tabernacle had a lot of things going on. There were, at one point in time, there were 60, more than 60 ministries that were being simultaneously kind of run and pipelined through the church. Charles Spurgeon has his hands in all of them in some way, shape, or form. At the very least, every one of those ministries hosted uh, an annual dinner, and Charles Spurgeon was the keynote speaker at every one of those annual dinners. So you can do the math, you can do the average on that. That means he's speaking at on an average of more than one dinner a week at some times. And on top of that... He's preaching. He preaches and teaches all the time. He starts a pastor's college. He lectures every Friday morning for, for folks in his pastor college. He's teaching preaching to a group of guys. So he talks all the time. He teaches all the time. He preaches all the time. That's just in his church. He also gets invitation to go and do that other places around London. He's a busy guy. He's got a lot going on. He's got a lot on his plate. And so you say, hey, well, in the midst of all that, how is it that people are saying he's the greatest preacher in London in this, this era, in this time? How does a man who's so busy, how does he... How does he pull that off? Well, practically, he tried to cram as much as he could. He'd think about the topic of a sermon during the week. He'd read books. He would think on it. And then at the end of the week, on Saturday night, you know, they tell you, they tell you in seminary, avoid Saturday night specials. Every Saturday night was a Saturday night special for Charles Spurgeon. It's on Saturday night, for the first time all week, his family would have people over. They would have dinner. They would have tea. He would excuse himself from tea. And he would go, and he would get in his study, and for the first time on Saturday night, all week, he would open his Bible and look at his text. He'd start studying his text, and then he would start arranging his sermon, start thinking through how he's going to arrange his sermon. When uh, his wife dismissed the guests from tea, she would come into the office. She would break out a commentary. Uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with it. Oftentimes, it was Matthew Henry's commentary. Break out Matthew Henry, Henry's commentary and start reading it to him. He'd make a few notes. By the time he, he, he got done with, with the notes, he had a kind of rough skeleton. He jotted a few things down. He had his outline. He might leave it sitting on the desk. He might put it in the Bible and take it with him. And then he went to bed. And then he got up and he went and preached. And that was apparently all it took for him to be one of the greatest preachers to ever live. And so people asked him, how do you do this? Why are you so successful? I don't understand. And he said, because my people pray for me. It's because people pray for me. It wasn't just lip service. It wasn't just one of those things. Well, because he's a pastor and pastors are supposed to say, say things like that, that's not why, why he said it. No, there were five college students who came to visit one morning. They came to see Spurgeon, and they, as they walk in the door, lo and behold, here's Charles Spurgeon walking through the lobby. And he walks up to these young men who come to visit him, and, and he says, hey, uh, would you guys like to see the, the heating plant for this church? You want to see how we heat this place? And it's the middle of July, and these guys are standing there, and they're like... <laughs> No, not really. But when Charles Spurgeon asks you, you know, hey, do you want to see the heating plant for this place? And he's trying to give you a tour. What do you say? Yeah, sure. I'd love to see it. I'm actually a little chilly now that you say that. Please show us how you, how you heat this place. So he takes him on a tour. And he walks him downstairs. And he comes up this door. And he gets real quiet. And he cracks the door. And they look in the room. And there's 700 people praying before service on a Sunday morning. And he said, that's how we heat this place. This is the heating plant of this church. Brothers and sisters, we are supposed to be a people who are radically dependent on the Lord. And prayer is one of the ways that we express our radical dependence on the Lord. If you are like me and you believe that there's nothing good in us except 
for the work of Jesus Christ. And we are, should know that we are people radically dependent upon him. And we should pray that way. We should pray knowing that if the Lord doesn't move, nothing's going to happen. Unless the Lord builds the house, we can labor all we want to, and we're going to labor in vain. If we will ever do anything important or lasting or fruitful or meaningful in ministry, it's going to come from a radical dependence on the Lord. Now, so far, I've resisted the urge to apply this to myself, but I'll go ahead and apply this to myself. If you would like me week in and week out, to get up here and to preach out of my own strength and my own wisdom and my own insight, and you'd like me to get down there and preach a couple times a week, teach a couple times out a week out of my own strength and my own intellect and my own insight. If you want me to go and disciple our folks out of my own strength and my own wisdom, if you want me to counsel the people who come and talk to us out of my own strength and my own wisdom, if you want me to go do personal evangelism out in the community out of my own ability to think I can talk somebody into something, don't pray for me. And that's what I have to do. But if you trust like I trust, that there's nothing good in me apart from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the specific calling that he's put on my life, which I'm trying to steward as faithfully as I can, then please pray for me. Then pr please pray for me that I might be able to do it out of his strength and not my strength. I want you to consider one more time what Paul has asked these people to pray for. At the same time, Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So look, this is what he wants them to pray for him. He wants them to pray, verse 3, pray for us that the Lord may open a door to us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, right? So we remember, from, again, from chapter 1, second week of January, when we're looking at the end of chapter 1, the mystery of Christ, we've decided, we've seen, he's talking about the gospel. So here's what I want. I want the Lord to open up a door so that we can declare the gospel, the same gospel which has me in prison. I'm in prison for the gospel, and what I want is you to pray, not for my release. I want you to pray I might have more opportunities to preach the gospel, that's what I want. And, it, and here is where, just from a personal insight perspective, I'm really convicted. Because I'm just sitting here thinking, as someone who's a minister of the gospel, if I was in jail for preaching the gospel, would my wherewithal be, hey, you know what I really need my people to pray for? That I'd be able to preach the gospel. That I have more opportunities to preach the gospel. That I, I would, my life would be wrapped up in that. I pray that by the Lord's help, I'd be able to say that. I pray that by the Lord's help, I'd be able to do that. But I know it would take the Lord's help. But I'll just put it to you really plainly. We need more people in pulpits who are like Paul. We need more people who know that this is what they've been entrusted to do. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is placed on me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul understood this is not something I do to line my pockets. This is not something I do because it makes me comfortable. This is not something I do because it gives me a cool place in the Christian community. No, he did it because the spirit of the Lord constrained him. He's a gospel preacher to the core. If you pricked him, he would bleed the Bible. He was a gospel preacher. And we need more people who preach to be like that. Called and constrained to preach the word and nothing but the word. So help me God. We need more people like that. I'm afraid that over the course of the last 350 years of ease and comfort that we've had in American society, that we have now kind of a mixed bag of folks in pulpits standing somewhere this morning who may be preaching for any variety uh, of reasons. And I could say more, but I won't because I'm going to start preaching to people who aren't in the room. But I would just say to folks in my position, it's probably time that we start figuring out why we're doing this. Why are we in the gospel ministry? What are we in it for? Because we're not the home team anymore. And we are going to start to incur costs that are higher than the cost we've had to pay in the last 350 years. And we all might want to start thinking about whether we're willing to pay those costs. Challenges are going to come. They're going to be here. And it's our job at, together to get one another ready so that we will be a faithful people even in the midst of those challenges. That's what Paul wants. That's what he prays for. Look at verse 4. Pray that I may make it clear. So I, just, I don't just want opportunities to preach the gospel. I want, I want to make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. You know, it's tempting when you're in a hostile culture that doesn't want to hear the gospel. It's tempting to try to cut corners. There's a temptation there to try to water things down. There's a temptation there to try to discount the gospel. There's a temptation there to try to be a little bit vague. That's a real temptation. Paul prays against that temptation. He doesn't want that temptation. 
There's a temptation to, to, to maybe try to keep folks from, from seeing what you're saying when you say the gospel. Well, uh, is he really saying that he literally thinks God created the heavens and the earth from nothing? Is he, is he really saying that, that I deserve as a sinner to go to hell? Is he really saying that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven? Is he really saying that if I don't love the Lordship of Jesus, Jesus can't save me? There's a temptation to say, no, I'm not saying that. There's a temptation to say, oh, it's not as bad as it sounds. No, brothers and sisters, that's what it is. This is the gospel. This is the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. We can't move from it, and we don't want to make it vague. We don't want to make it discounted because a vague, discounted gospel can't save anybody. Hence, the letter of Colossians. Paul has wrote to rebuke these, these teachers who are trying to sell a vague, discounted gospel. And Paul's saying, this can't help us. So pray for me. And as you pray for me that I would have gospel opportunities, pray that I don't cut off corners. Pray that I don't water it down. Pray that I put flesh on it and manifest it for people that they might know exactly what I'm talking about. And so that when I call them to repent and believe, they would know what they're repenting and believing in. Pray that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to make it. Pray for us also. Well, after three verses on prayer, we come to verse 5, where we see that these gospel people, uh, they're commanded also to advance by the way they walk. So not just by their prayer, but they're commanded to advance by the way they walk. Look at verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Well, what does that phrase mean, walk in wisdom? I think it's pretty simple. I think it's a command that we're supposed to use, use good judgment. Same like we saw wisdom. Paul prayed for them in wisdom again in chapter, in chapter 1. And that wisdom there is that you might know how to apply what you, what, you, what you know. And so here's the same thing. Use good judgment. Use good judgment as you live, as you walk, as, as in your pattern of life. Practice good judgment, particularly we're concerned with practicing good judgment in the sight of outsiders, towards outsiders. Outsiders, that's offensive. That sounds uh, exclusive. Well, brothers and sisters, this is just the reality of it. We were, we were just there a couple of weeks ago in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and Paul is saying, hey, look, you are, you're ambassadors. You're ambassadors, and you are, are pleading with others. God, through, through you, is pleading, hey, be reconciled to Christ. There's reconciliation that needs to happen, which means, contrary to popular belief, we're not all in the same boat. So as people who aren't all in the same boat, the, the plea to folks who are outside the kingdom of God is, please, I'm pleading with you, be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You can have that, and I plead with you to take that. Be reconciled to God. We're ambassadors. We're supposed to walk with some level of intentionality, with some level of urgency, because we want to make the best use of the time. We don't have unlimited time. There, this doesn't go on forever and ever. Mine and your life will stop one day, and the Lord's going to come back one day. We have a limited, a finite amount of time, and so we want to make the best use of that time. We want to practice good judgment, and we want to live wisely in front of outsiders every moment that we have. And there are opportunities around us every single day. Every single day. With every action, we're establishing a platform. That platform is either helping us or hindering our ability to share the gospel with folks that we come into contact with. I have folks tell me all the time, you know, I, have, I just don't have any opportunities to, to share the gospel. I don't have any opportunity. I don't have any opportunities. And, and through those conversations, oftentimes, I'm able to show those people, hey, you may have more, more opportunities than you think. Other times in that conversation, what, what kind of gets drawn out is that maybe you don't want to share the gospel as bad as you, you think you do. You actually just need some boldness to take some of the opportunities that, that you have, right? But I just paint it really, really like practical and, and clear for you, right? If you're one of those people and you're saying, you know, uh, I really struggle with that, then I'm just going to say to you, I don't really care where you work or, or where you live or what your job is or who you come into contact with or who your family is or how many lost friends you have. You can start something right now today when you leave this place. You could leave from here, and what you're going to want to do is you just pick a gas station. You just pick one. Maybe it's on your way home. Maybe it's one you like to go to. Maybe it's one that got the snacks that you, you think are the best or whatever. Uh, and you're just going to walk in that gas station. And when you go in there, uh, if you don't get anything else, just go get a drink. Just go to the back. This is a pro tip. There are a good many of the stores around here this week. I, I was pleased to notice. Got back in stock the kind of tall bottles of Diet Mountain Dew. 
I would recommend those to you heartily. There's 20% more uh, Mountain Dew in those bottles. It tells you that on the label. All the Dew, none of the calories. So I would recommend that to you if you're looking for, for a drink this afternoon. So you just go get you one of those. And you take that bad boy up, and as you walk up to the counter, you just kind of size it up, and you see which cashier you think might be the easiest to talk to, which one looks the friendliest, and you just go and you sit that diet dude down right in front of them, and you just say, hey, how's your day going? You just look them in the eyes as if they're uh, an image bearer, created in the image of God. They have inherent dignity and value and worth, and they deserve your respect because the Lord's created them because that's who they are, right? So you just treat them like that, and you say, hey, how's your day going? And you buy the diet Mountain Dew from them. And then next week when you leave here, this is how most places work. Probably going to be the same person there. You, what you going to do? You go in there, you get you another diet dude, because it's still going to be good next week. And you go and you walk right up to the counter and you say, hey, how are you doing? What, what's your name? I saw you in here last week. What's your name? Okay, now I've got your name. Now, now we're going to talk a little bit. And then you do that the next week and the next week. And one of those weeks, you're just going to want to do the same process, go in there, wash, rinse, repeat. And you go up there and you sit that diet dude down and you say, hey, I see you here every Sunday. Do you, do you ever get to go to church anywhere? Were you, you raised in church somewhere? Now they know you want to talk to them about the Lord, all right? And so you keep going there, and you keep hanging out, and you keep having conversations every Sunday afternoon for the next couple of months. And by the end of the couple of months, they will hear whatever you want to talk about. They will know you care about them. They will know that you value them as a person, and they will give you the time of day to talk to them about the state of their soul. You have opportunities if you will take them. They are there. Will you make them? Opportunities are here. We need to be a people who walk in wisdom. Now, even as I say that, even as I give that example, I've already kind of bled into verse 6 a little bit. If you've cheated down and looked at verse 6, you kind of know what's coming here. The two are inextricably linked, so I'm not going to make any apologies for, for cheating and bleeding into verse 6 just a little bit. But I would just have you notice what comes first. Verse 5 comes first. The, the way you walk is foundational for what you're going to have to turn around and say. We all know people, every single one of us, we know people whose actions speak so loudly we can't actually hear anything they say. Because of who they are, because of how they carry themselves, we, we have a very hard time listening to them. So brothers and sisters, if you walk in ignorance, people aren't going to want to hear what you have to say. Your conversation that you need to have with the random cashier at the gas station, it's predicated on you going to the gas station and you having a smile on your face and you holding the door open for people and you being nice to people and you looking people in the eyes when you talk to them. If you aren't willing to do those things, you're not going to set yourself up for success and having a good gospel conversation. The way we walk is really important. But we're commanded to talk. You do eventually have to speak. You can't just go to the gas station and hold the door open and smile at people and people come to know the Lord. No, you're eventually going to have to use words. It's reported that St. Francis said, hey, preach the gospel when necessary, use words. Now, there's no proof that he ever said that. Nobody can verify where he said that at. But I'll just say, if he said that or whoever said that, it's very misleading. The gospel's not a good deed. It's not even a package of good deeds. It's a message. It's good news. And good news, the communication of good news requires we're going to have to eventually get bold enough to use some words. You eventually have to speak. Let's look at verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So the third thing that we see today, these, these people, how are these people, these gospel people, how are they commanded to advance? Well, they are now commanded to advance by the way they talk, by their prayers, by their walking, and now by their talking. And verse 6 is verse that we've just Read, I would submit to you that it is simultaneously one of the most common sense verses in the Bible, and yet it's, it's incredibly difficult for so many of us to live out. Very hard for us to live out. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. What's that mean? Salt. What's that mean? Uh, salt is used in, in the Bible as a metaphor in several different ways. The way that it's used uh, here it seems to primarily be in the way that we use it today, right? Salt is a, is a flavor enhancer. Salt flat out makes a lot of things taste better. And most people with taste buds would tell you that most food is better with seasoning on. Uh, just yesterday, uh, I was eating breakfast with, with, with a buddy, and uh, our food comes out. They sit it down, and there's not a salt shaker on our table. So Buddy gets up and goes and grabs salt taker off the, the table beside us, and he brings it back, and I was so grateful for that because eggs are just better with, with salt on them. It makes stuff taste better. 
And so the implication here is we kind of think through that, that metaphor. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that as we season our speech with salt, as we try to speak in grace, that the words that we say ought to be palatable. Now, I'm not saying, I'm emphatically not saying that we bend the message, that we cut corners, that we water it down and round things off. No, the message stays the message, but we aim to say it in such a way that it's clear that we're trying to be gracious and winsome and that the words we say are coming out of a place of love. Friends, you can say what needs to be said and still communicate to people that you love them. It, is, it, it never ceases to, to amaze me how graceless we can be when we are sharing the gospel of, I don't know, grace. So if it's the gospel of grace, does it make sense? We should speak it. We should preach it. We should proclaim it to people in a, in a measure of gracefulness. I don't really know where, where the, the thing comes from that, you know, we all of a sudden we're in the middle of a gospel conversation and it's turned into an argument or we've gotten ourselves in a fight with somebody over something trivial. I have no idea where that comes from. I would just say it's not biblical. It's, it's emphatically not biblical. I've been reading uh, Timothy the last few days in my quiet time and I just keep uh, finding over and over again, you know, the command that is given to, to Timothy is, Timothy, you gotta be gentle, brother. You've got to be gentle. You've got to be gentle. You've got to be gentle with, with outsiders. You've got to be gentle. So the idea that we're, we're just going to come off the top rope and, and rebuke people and slam them down, and just, that, that's, not, that's not biblical. That's not where this is coming from. The command to share the gospel is not a command to go out and pick fights. It's, if that's how you've interpreted the Great Commission, then, then I understand why you struggle with this verse. Because there's no room left for you to be gracious. There's no room left for you to season your speech with salt if you think it's your divine uh, command to go out and pick fights with folks. That's not what this is about. Uh, there are many of you who have taken me up on our challenge through the book of Colossians to, to share the gospel with folks. I've been really encouraged by that. A lot of you have shared the gospel in 2023 thus far. And we've gotten to hear about it and we've gotten to pray over those conversations in our time together on, on Sunday nights and, and Wednesday nights. I would encourage you to continue to do that. That's not going anywhere. That's going to continue to be uh, something that we, we try to emphasize to the best of our ability. We want to be a gospel people and a gospel sharing people. But I would just say to you, if you've shared the gospel this year or if you've shared the gospel sometime in times past and you found yourself at some point in that conversation just frustrated beyond belief, this happens to me too. I'm not talking to any particular, uh, any, any particular person or any particular people. We, I think we all struggle with this. But in the middle of that gospel conversation, you were just frustrated. You are frustrated to the point where it was hard for you to speak with grace. Maybe it was hard for you to let your speech be seasoned with salt. Then, then I just want to give you one, uh, one tip here. I want to just kind of show you one thing that I think will, will help you and frame the way we think about this. Uh, we simply flat out cannot expect folks who aren't walking with the Lord to act like they're walking with the Lord. That's what spiritual blindness is. That's what spiritual blindness does. When you talk to an unbeliever, just be prepared. They're probably going to act like an unbeliever. They're probably going to, if they don't know the Lord and you're fearful that they're outside of the kingdom of God, just don't expect them to act like they're in the kingdom of God. They're going to have different morals than you. That's okay. They're going to think differently than you. That's okay. They're going to talk in a way that you're probably not comfortable talking. That's, a, that's okay. They're going to do that. And I would just point out to us, right, your goal, our goal in evangelistic conversation is not to reform a person's morals. Our goal is, is in evangelism is to commend to them the all-surpassing worth of Christ and just graciously, winsomely offer defense for the hope that is in us. That's all we're trying to do when we share the gospel with others. Graciously, winsomely Make a defense for the hope that is within us. Which accords with, with the last phrase of our text this morning. So that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I'll just say this to you. If people know that you love them, if people know that you care about them, if people have seen that you uh, treat them with respect and dignity and you go out of your way to serve them, They'll, they'll hear whatever you need to say. They'll let you say what you need to say. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to repent and be in sackcloth and ashes because you had one conversation with them. No, nope. conversion is the work of the Lord. We need the Lord to, to do a work in, in folks' heart, but they'll hear you. If you communicate out of a place of winsomeness and graciousness and love, love for that person, they will hear you every single time. Maybe you've heard of a guy named Ben Franklin. 
You know, I'm talking about like founding father Ben Franklin, electricity with a, with a kite, with a key. Ben Franklin, that's the guy I'm talking about. Maybe you've heard of him. Ben Franklin uh, was a deist. Uh, ben Franklin, uh, that's pretty well established. He believed in the existence of God. He just didn't believe that God was, was personally involved in the universe that he created. Therefore, he wasn't very interested in, in Jesus. He was a deist, and, and that was his position. And being a deist, he had one like, really kind of strange, close friendship. One of Ben Franklin's best friends was a guy named George Whitfield. George, George Whitfield was an evangelist in the Second Great Awakening uh, in the mid-18th century. George, George Whitfield was a prominent evangelist. He was prominent to the point that uh, in the early 1840s in Boston, when there were 10,000 people living in Boston, 17,000 people came to hear Whitfield preached in Boston. More people than lived in Boston. He's a very prominent evangelist. Folks have called him the best evangelist since the Apostle Paul. And being the evangelist that he was, in his friendship with Ben Franklin, they struck up in America when, when uh, Whitfield would be over here on, on preaching tours. Ben Franklin heard the gospel a lot. He heard the gospel very, very frequently. I've read things that they've, wrote, they've, they've written to one another, and uh, they're very direct. Very direct. Whitfield is very clear. Hey, uh, Ben Franklin, I think you're lost. You have a problem. You need to wrestle with Jesus. You need to experience a new birth. You are, you are not in a safe place to die, Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin will write back and say, you know, whatever he says and say, I, think, I, I appreciate your concern. I'm fine. I'm not interested. On and on and on. And they're best friends. They really care about each other. They really love each other. And, and I can prove it to you. I'll read you something that Ben Franklin wrote. He wrote this to an official in Georgia in reference to stuff that had gone on around the death of Whitfield. Whitfield just died, and this is what he writes. He says, mentioning Mr. Whitfield, I cannot forbear expressing the pleasure it gave me to see in the newspapers an account of the respect paid to his memory by your assembly. I knew him intimately upwards of 30 years. His integrity, disinterestedness, which means objectiveness, and indefatigable zeal means he never got tired of it, and prosecuting every good work. I've never seen it equaled, and I shall never see it exceeded. That's the testimony of an unbeliever who died in his sin, an unbeliever talking about an evangelist who preached the gospel to him every time he talked to him. He loved him because he knew Whitfield loved him. He knew that everything Whitfield said came out of a place of love and concern for him. And Whitfield, even as he spoke to him directly, spoke to him winsomely and graciously. So my friends, it is possible to live in such a way and speak in such a way that those who disagree with us still love us and still know that we love them. And as it was for the Colossians, so it will be with us. If we will be a faithful people, if the gospel we advance through the humble ministry that we hear as a community at Grace Chapel Baptist Church, the, the ministry that we undertake in the name of the Lord Jesus, we must be a people of prayer. We must be a people who keep our eyes up to see how the Lord is at work, and we must strive to submit ourselves to his agenda in every situation. We must pray for the preaching of the gospel, that it will be made clear, which is how it ought to be declared. We must walk. We must walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, a people of wisdom, a people who use good judgment to build bridges with outsiders to share the gospel with them. And then we must be bold enough to speak our words that we need to speak, and those words need to be gracious enough that they receive a hearing. It's my prayer that you would feel the weight of this commission, the weight of this command from the Lord. We know what's gone wrong. We know what's going to make it right. And now it's time to get wrong for the advance of his kingdom to the praise of his glory. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, we do thank you. You've not only given us the gospel, you've not only given us the good news, you've not only sent us your son, but you've told us the implications of that gospel. You've told us that to trust the Lord means that we are to put off the old self and we are to put on the new self. And Lord, as you even inspire this letter to these Colossians that tells them, here's what we're supposed to do. We here this morning read, here's what we're supposed to do. Lord, I pray that you would make us a people of deep prayer out of a radical dependence on you. I pray, Lord, that you would make us a people who walk in a way worthy of you, Lord, that we might be 
a wise people in the midst of a lost world. And Lord, I pray that we be a people who speak graciously. A people whose speech is seasoned with salt. A people who let everybody know that we love them and that we care about them. And then we want what's best for them, which is you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to have our, our song response. I'll be down in front if there's anything you'd like to talk to me about or, or pray with me about.
again, uh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight at 6 p.m. We'd love to have you uh, back with us. Normal weekly events are on the board. You can find those there. I'm just going to reread these last two commands that we got. That will be our benediction today, and then we'll sing the doxology. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person.